All right. I think we're about ready to, to resume. Is that yes. all right? Jill and I are ready. If you start it, they will come. Okay. That's what they told us when we ran evangelistic tent meetings. And Just Jill, begin. <laughs> Preach it. So, has everyone completed their observation assessments? Yes. yes. <laughs> the pastor shakes his head. The, the path of good intention <laughs> yes. does indeed lead to hell. <laughs> Alas. Yes. How about your observation assessment summary? Did you do that no. on page 85? Yes. No. If you have not done that, right now is the time to do it. You can do it real quick. You're good. Now, just real quick, what you're trying to discover is your spiritual gift cluster. What are those few gifts that are the highest? It may be two, it may be three, it may be four. What's your spiritual gift cluster? And you want to uh, use both your, your uh, spiritual gift assessment and your observation assessment to discover that. So you may find there's some differences, but now it's time for you to use your own judgment and discernment to see which of those actually capture your cluster. So on page 85, use the sheet, this sheet to compile the observation assessment responses you receive. Whenever an observer marked Y for a spiritual gift, put two check marks in the appropriate block for that spiritual gift. Whenever an observer marked S for a spiritual gift, put one check mark in the appropriate block for that spiritual gift. Leave the blocks blank for N and question mark responses. Okay? When you've done this for each observation assessment, total the number of check marks for each spiritual gift in the column headed total, row, row total. So you'll see number one, thank you so much, A, A is administration, B is apostleship. So look and see if those observers uh, said, yeah, put two check marks. You might find that your observers were less discriminate as your spiritual gifts assessment might have been. But that's all right. Let's just try and fill it out. They had me double check marks for just about everything, but I got nothing for crafting. Dude, we're on it. Like I would tell the Pathfinders, when we water ski at Jim Grindle's place, take your time, but hurry. <laughs> Now, when you have finished compiling the individual observation assessment, check what seemed to you to be the spiritual gifts these persons have identified in you. Write these spiritual gifts on the lines in the observation assessment box on page 87. On page 87. And so you'll have two. One is the spiritual gift assessment that you've done. Make sure you fill that out. And then the observation assessment that was done and see if they match. How many of them match? Maybe if you have matching on and two, you will have identified your spiritual gift cluster.
Have we discovered anyone with the gift of teaching yet? Yeah. This has at least the last half. We did our own the first half. Wow. Yes. Somebody did our last half. That's amazing. <laughs> it is. Wow, they're sitting there. They, they, he got those shots. That's what I thought. That's amazing. Yes. Think it's going be fun. Exactly. Well, we'll learn what somebody else needs. Right, maybe you can write just below there or something. Now this, when, when you are either organizing a Connections seminar team for the church, this is a good time 
in the seminar to stop and to say, if you liked or benefited from what you have learned, we would like you to sponsor someone else. The book costs $10 and then you just send it around and you can keep <laughs> resupplying the books, okay? <laughs> Feel free. You all heard the spiel. <laughs> so we should be on page 89, right? Well, if you're on 87, I want to make sure you, now that you have taken your judgment from both the observation assessment and the spiritual gifts assessment, mm -hmm. and you write down my spiritual gifts are, and write what they are. What are, what are your gift clusters? I wrote there, knowledge, Prophecy, evangelism, teaching. <laughs> Was it prophecy that made you laugh or teaching? <laughs> uh, oh, you have, you have this? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Let's see, what else do you have? There? There? And you can you kept them. That's fine. Yeah, can you can still put it there. You can still put it there. Do you see that? Is that it's a part of your business cluster? Yeah. Uh, so do you yeah. feel cheated by that? Mm -hmm. That's what encouragement is. That's what it is. That's right. That's right. Barnabas was the encourager. That's good. That's excellent. Give Find a partner and, and share what your spiritual gifts are before we move on. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity to talk to each other. And don't forget to take what you wrote down on page 87 and transfer it to page 140. So you have already put there what your passion is. Sometimes you might revise your, I, I revise my passion from what I initially put there and, uh, and I wrote my passion was community development and discipleship and that's what I wrote down. My spiritual gifts, however, I kept with what I saw. Knowledge, teaching, evangelism, and prophecy. And that was based on both the observation assessment and the spiritual gift assessment. So feel free, in other words, to now work in your own skin. assessment that you did last week and then see if there's any match I'm trying to name your right. In fact the first time I did this I didn't even get any observations. I just used my own judgment. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't tell anyone that. <laughs>
If you feel like we're moving slower, don't worry, we're actually moving faster. Because the rest of it moves real <laughs> exactly. So what you get on your spiritual gift is that second Right? So, so go there from the spiritual gifts assessment on page 54. So I think write that in first. And, and then see if your observations and matchings that you feel confirm. This is good. And if you didn't get all of the observation assessments, that's all right. Work from your spiritual gift assessment, and you can plug that in. And uh, you can either pencil it in and make amendments, or just write it in and be leave space to amend after you get observation assessments if you feel you need more confirmation. It's cooler in there. So oh, yeah. okay. All right, good. The okay. is your struggles. Yes, no, that's all right. That's all right. This would have been really helpful if, like, one other person in my was going to call that my I think I know who that person is. So let's let's look at session. Let's look at session five. And and if you're not finished with the other, you can still do some of the other while you do session five. All right. Uh, page eighty nine. <laughs> What can I do to make a difference? In this session, you will further clarify your spiritual gifts. What page are you on? Uh, page 89. <coughs> page 89. In this session, you will further clarify your spiritual gift. List, you'll list three general cautions when using your spiritual gifts. And you will link your primary passion and your primary spiritual gift. That's that's an important thing to do. So let's let's see what we do here. Um, page ninety. The following reference material provides some additional information on each spiritual gift. Individuals with a particular spiritual gift typically evidence certain traits, some of which are listed. You may find these helpful in better understanding or confirming your spiritual gifts. So if you don't mind, I'll use mine as an example so you can see uh, how I resource this, and then you all can, uh, can do it with yours. So here's the directions. Locate in the spiritual gifts, spiritual gift reference assessment what you've identified as your primary spiritual gift. As you read through the information about your spiritual gift, check check any item you feel applies to you. If you begin to sense that the items are not particularly descriptive of you, take a look at what you've identified as your second spiritual gift. See if that may be a better match. The spiritual gift reference assessment is provided to help you achieve a better understanding of your spiritual gift. Keep in mind that Final affirmation of your spiritual gift comes from the body of Christ. So here's an example. My primary spiritual gift was knowledge. So let's let's turn to see where is knowledge at here. Uh, 
H I J K K. On page 105. So what I did, I went to page 105. The literal meaning to know. How about this for a description? The gift of knowledge is the divine enablement to bring truth to the body through biblical insight. Distinctives. People with this gift, and I just put a, an X through every box that I thought actually described me. Um, and believe me when I tell you, I was embarrassed that I had this gift. Because I, I, the one thing I never feel like is that I have knowledge. I feel like that's why I read, because I just feel so ignorant. And then everyone else kept saying, you know, you're a pastor, but you might want to go into teaching. I always thought, they're saying that because they don't like it when I tell them what they should do from the <laughs> word of God. <laughs> but no. So I, I learned to own this, all right? But people with this gift. Now, I, I put an X. Discover biblical truth which enables them to better serve the body. I, I thought that was fairly descriptive of me. I also put an X through the next one. Search the scriptures for insight, understanding, and truth. Um, I put an X through the next one. Have unusual insight or understanding that serves the church. I like to think that about myself, but it definitely was unusual. Um, how about I put an X through the next one. Organize information for teaching and practical use. So with the distinctives, I thought that did describe me. Now with the traits, I thought, yes, I was inquisitive. I put an X there. I did not put an X through responsive or observant because Especially at that time, I didn't think they were descriptive of me. I think I've learned to be a little more observant. I'm not, I'm not certain I'm not that I'm that responsive yet. But I put an X through the last four, insightful, reflective, studious, truthful. At least I, I, I thought that was describing a d descriptive of, of me. I, a truthful man. I had truthful expressions. Maybe not that I knew the truth, but nevertheless. And the cautions, all of them I thought applied to me. People with this gift need to be careful of this gift leading to pride, knowledge puffs up. Yeah, I realized I had a problem with arrogance in discussions that I needed to deal with. Um, should remember that it's God's message, not theirs, when they give a word of knowledge to the church. I learned that I, I, I took a lot of ownership of things that you didn't know. <laughs> didn't know and puffed up my pride, you see. And so it was a helpful caution. You know, and then need to remember with the increase of knowledge comes the increase seeing of pain. And I thought that was true. I'm a blues personality. I have struggles sometimes with depression. And all those were descriptive of who I, I, I was, I thought. And then I just went through the others. So take your spiritual gifts, your primary one first. And uh, if you feel there's some confirmation, do the second, do with your second or third. See how much of your gift cluster is matched by those traits. By the end of that, we're on page 114. So. <laughs> you don't have to read through all of them. Just read through those where you have them. Your gift cluster.
Uh, oh, this might have been the one that, that we had last week then. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Uh, I don't, that's all right. It's, <laughs> I may make the same mistake of going to my car to get it the next time and find out it's been used. <laughs> I see, I see people exercising their gifts right now in this room. Those with the gift of balance. That's probably <laughs> This is moving along great. We're about to hit brass tacks. <laughs> because I see people already who are going to uh, be on this ministry of, of, of spiritual gifts, a spiritual gift and placement team here in, in the Santa Clarita Seventh day Adventist Church. So on page 114, here are the directions. Further clarify your spiritual gifts by sharing with your group. So get a shoulder partner for three in a group. But here's what you want to share. Share what your primary spiritual gift is and why you think you have it. Why, why do you think God graced you with that? And then also cautions you think you have to be aware of when using this spiritual gift. Listen to the others in your group as they share their spiritual gifts to get a better understanding of other spiritual gifts, all right? So do that. Share in a little group. What is your primary spiritual gift? Why do you think you have it? And what are the cautions you think you need to be aware of? This is beautiful. 
I got to go out Oh, this is going good. Ah, that surprised me. It did surprise me. I don't think it surprised people who know you. And where's that? 
Did that surprise you? No. Okay. And which was the highest? Actually, yeah. When I got knowledge, it surprised me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect that to be that. Yeah. So, so this is good. <laughs> we have some warnings about that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Is there something in your story growing up you are among many siblings and you are one of all kind of, I don't know. I could have one or two siblings, but I don't generate I'm not a strong person. So my, you, you went about wisdom the way Solomon did. I think that must have happened. My children are the ones that I've been writing with you. Now, I'm sort of in places. Well, knowledge, actually, that's a good question. I think that that's really just a great question. I even to this day don't feel like the first time I know. But you have a great hunger. But I have a That I think I have a hunger for my life. When he's working with my father and his knowledge was breaking down, I realized, you know what? I was sitting out here in the desert learning this. So I started going to work with the book. And whenever the trunk would break down, I would just read it until we got help. And the more I read, the more I realized I didn't know. Like, you know, Henry Jones? He used to pastor the Lancaster Church in Hill Denver. I finished my doctorate at Claremont. We were having a celebration. He puts his arm around me and said, He said, I found out they learned more and more about lessons and lessons so they know a whole lot about them. <laughs> and I. When he said that, it made me feel good because yeah. I said, you know what? That is so true. I, I, you know, it took me this long to learn this little thing. Just think of everything I don't know. Right, <laughs> and, right. And so, right, but what a relief that was. It, it was a relief yeah. right then and there. Right. Yeah. All right, let, let, let's, let's now kind of regroup and look on page 115. We're ahead of schedule. I need to slow this down. <laughs> Page 115. So, write down the word. These are the general cautions. You, you dealt with specific cautions about your own spiritual gift, but here are general cautions for all of us. Number one, projection. Do as I do. We should not project our gifts onto others. They have their spiritual gifts. And uh, I'm not going to disclose a conversation that I had a long time ago, a million miles away, where someone said the challenge is she thinks I should have her gift. <laughs> Right, but this is what we don't want to do. We don't want to project. Different people have different gifts. I had to learn that the hard way. I had to learn it as a pastor the hard way, being frustrated on committing and not being observant and appreciative of the gifts that others have. All right? Here's another general caution elevation. I have a more important spiritual gift than you do. <laughs> That is something we cannot have, and that's why the Apostle Paul uses these wonderful metaphors of the body. Um, I had a member at the Lancaster Church who cut off his toe while he was mowing his lawn. He was mowing his lawn, he didn't have, he had on flip-flops, and when he fell back into a ditch, 
you know, you're falling, your natural tendency is to pull whatever you have to you to pull you up, but he's, of course, pulling the line back to his toe. And you know, he told me, he said, you wouldn't believe how much just this much of your big toe helps you to balance. Right? So, um, elevation. We, 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 you know, that church can work really good when members in the church don't project their gifts on others and don't elevate their own gifts above those that God has given to the others. And then, the last one, rejection. I don't have a spiritual gift. Hopefully this exercise is helping you to discern and narrow down and get a little uh, closer picture of the spiritual gift that you have. Unfortunately, I'm a pugilist, so I, I immediately, I tuned in even better when, when Elder Roper was talking about Mike Tyson, because I used to love watching Mike Tyson, and we have the week, you know, the boxing and the wind, you know, if you've ever done the boxing and the wind, your player knocks down, they have these kind of circles that are, that are like a man who's, and you gotta align those circles, and if you align those circles, your player will get back up, you know. Well, hopefully this exercise is helping you to get a, a better picture of what your gifts are and, and to know them. Because if you have been baptized into the body of believers, you have been gifted. Uh, every time we do a baptism, immediately after we would bring the candidates up and we would put our hand on them and pray and say, now let your spirit fall so they'll have the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, they'll be in the spirit on the Lord's day. You see what I'm saying? You have a, a spiritual gift, all right? So let's keep those cautions of projection, elevation, and rejection in the forefront of our mind. Let's look at 116. Now, we're going to link our spiritual gifts to our passion. Remember, you had a passion. Some of you may have named your passion one way, and now you're getting a little, this may help you to see how to align your spiritual gift and your passion. So let's look at situation one. These are people who all have the same passion, but they have different spiritual gifts. People serving in different positions within the same ministry. So Bob, Nancy, and Frank. Look at the passion that Bob has. What is it? Well, what about Nancy? Oh, Nancy has a passion for at-risk children. How about Frank? Where is his passion? So they share the same passion. They have a passion for at-risk children. But let's look at their spiritual gift. What is Bob's spiritual gift? How about Nancy and Frank? So now, what are the possible areas of service? For Bob, organizing events to serve children, coordinating classes and training, facilitating transportation, identifying resources and people to meet needs. He's dealing with at-risk children, but he's working at it in his spiritual gift. Do you see what's happening there? Or look at Nancy. Her gift is giving, so what is she doing? Funding a program and materials. Adopting a child or a family. Support training for volunteer workers. Do you see what's happening? They're still dealing with at-risk children. How about Frank? His gift is mercy, and he's dealing in a ministry for at-risk children. How does he operate? He leads a parent support group, serves as a volunteer care worker, being, being a foster parent. Do you see what's happening there? So these are people who have the same passion but different spiritual gifts. Let's look at situation number two. These are people with different passions, but they have the same gift. People serving in different ministries in similar positions. So, Kurt, what is his passion? How about Bonnie and Lynn? So they have different passions, but look what their spiritual gifts are. They all have the spiritual gift of teaching. 
So what does Kurt do? Here's a possible area of service. Kurt could lead Bible study in retirement homes, teach Sabbath school classes for or on the age. See what's happening? He's linking his spiritual gift and his passion. Bonnie could lead devotionals in homeless shelters, or she could teach Sabbath school classes on homelessness. Lynn could lead small groups, or she could mentor, or she could write self-guided training programs. All right? So these are ways where you can take your different passions with the same gift and put them to work. So here's an individual activity. Link your spiritual gift to passion. Here are the directions on page 118. In the first block, write down what you feel is your primary passion. In the second block, write down what you sense is your primary spiritual gift. And in the third block, I told you we were going to hit brass tacks. Write down some possible ministry areas in the Santa Clarita Seventh-day Adventist Church where you feel you can serve with your passion and spiritual gift. Okay. Everybody's getting nervous. <laughs> Remember, God's yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's going, to, he's going to be able to have some identifiable ministries. <laughs> I wrote in mind for my primary passion community development, discipleship, disciple, Christian discipleship slash cultural enrichment. I don't know what yours is, but hopefully they will. To find the language for them. Then I put down a Bible study teacher, a pastor, a discipleship teacher, but that, that was my, my sense. So we explored spiritual gifts by using the spiritual gift reference assessment. We learned three general cautions when using spiritual gifts caution against projection, elevation, and rejection. And we link our primary passion and spiritual gift. All right. Now that we've done that, we're going to move to session six. What's love got to do with it? Yeah. Why is music coming? Why is music coming? <laughs> the, the song of the day. <laughs> So you have 1 Corinthians 13, a famous passage. In this session, you will list the results of serving with love and without love, identify the differences between servility and servanthood, 
apply the principles of servanthood to an actual ministry situation and identify one aspect of servanthood you will concentrate on and a practical step you can take toward it. Why don't we get through se session six real quick, then we'll take a stand-up break after that and we'll finish out with se section seven. So here we are on page 122. I'll show you a more excellent way. You know that passage from 1 Corinthians 13, so let's go down. Spiritual gifts expressed without love do not reflect who God is and do not have a, here are the words, kingdom impact. Page 122. In the blank space is there. A kingdom impact. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy, boast, or proud. Not rude. Self-seeking. Not easily angry. Keeps no record of wrong. Doesn't delight in evil. Rejoices with the truth. Protects and trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. Uh, on page 123, servility is serving without love. Just write down, uh, so you'll have one metaphor to keep in mind, and you can always fill that in with other metaphors. Here's what ser 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 servility is, or serving without love. Convict laborers on the highway. Just write that down. Now you know, if you are feeling like you're a convict laborer, you're probably serving in a ministry that you're not gifted in or is not your passion. And we're trying to help align that so you can serve with passion. So servility is to serve without love and a good image of that of convict laborers. Servitude is serving with love. Now here's a, here's a good image of that. And adopt a highway student group. This is just the opposite. One, you know, you're kind of there, you, have, you want to get out of the, the cell, but you don't really care to do this service. The other, it's a volunteer work, it's an adopt a highway program. Okay, so those are two images, and you can find others and put there, and when you're teaching the Connection seminar, seminar, you can feel free to give that, those others. So let's look at, what is our motivation for serving? 124. Have you pen out? Servility serves out of obligation. Write that down. It is an I have to kind of attitude. <laughs> Servanthood serves out of obedience. It is an I want to serve God kind of attitude. All right? Servility is motivated to serve by concern for what others see. It is in servility, the motivation is driven by what will others say if I don't serve? Or if I don't serve in this ministry, or don't serve in this way, or don't commit to this kind of this kind of time, you see. So that's motivated by what others see. Servanthood is motivated by a concern for what God sees. In servanthood, we serve because we have fellowship and communion with God. We understand that ultimately we have an audience of one, right? Servility serves with the attitude of, it's not my job. Servility aims to do minimum, the minimum necessary to get by and fulfill the basis. basis. Servanthood serves with the attitude of whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So servanthood is willing to do, to go outside the job description to get things done. Servility has a ministry mindset that says, me first. Servility wants to advance its own agenda and is asking, what's in it for me? Servanthood has a ministry mindset that says, the Father first. Servants look up and say, Lord, what would you have me to do at this time? 
God, how could my life best honor you? How can I make a difference today in the way you have enabled me to touch lives? Servility serves with a spirit of pride. When we serve out of servility, we look at what we did and say, hey, I did that. I have something to offer. Aren't I something? I, I, I. Servanthood serves with a spirit of humility. Servanthood says, God did that. God has given me a spiritual gift and has filled me with the spirit to empower me for the faithful and meaningful expression of that spiritual gift. God has used me to have an impact in a person's life. In servility, the results are self-seeking. Believers prompted by servility will try to build up and draw attention to themselves. Servanthood, the results are God glorifying. Servanthood says, don't look at me. I'm glad to serve you. Give God the glory. Is it God wonderful? I like those two passages from scripture. On page 125, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Those are Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. And John quotes, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right. Ah, let you get we were moving fast. Directions. Each person discuss one aspect of servanthood, serving with love, that you would like to concentrate on and identify one practical step you can take toward it. So why don't you just do that in your groups? Give yourself about two minutes. Identify, uh, discuss one aspect of servanthood that you would like to concentrate on and then one practical step you can take toward it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, one more minute. You believe me when I tell you we're moving ahead of schedule? All right. Keep going, Jesus. Well, this is <laughs> So here's what we're going to do for our break. I want you to stand up right where you're at. Just take, take a quick stand up right where you're at. Now, if you'll just turn this way, face this wall. I don't know, is this this east? South. Uh, south? We're going to claim south. All right, turn south. Now, put your hands straight out in front of you. Now, take the shoulders of the person in front of you and give them a good massage. <laughs> you can just turn right there. Give them a good massage. Nice, nice, good back massage. All right. Yes, get behind, give her a good shoulder massage. There you go. Now we're going to turn in the opposite direction, 180 degrees. Put your hands out 
and return the favor. Nice shoulder massage. All right. There you go. All right. Now we're going to plug ahead and we're going to get be finished early so we can take a little break. Is that all right? So just put down, if you didn't yet, put down that one aspect, write it in the box that you would that you would like to concentrate on. I put, I'd like to concentrate on the results. I need to learn to glorify God more. And my one practical step uh, was to uh, read and reflect on how Jesus served and try to apply those practices in my own life. So that, you know, that's, you all may have had something different. That's all right. So session six, we studied the results of serving without love is that there is no impact for God's kingdom. Differences were identified between civility and servanthood, and principles of servanthood were applied to an actual ministry situation. Here's what's going to happen now, folks. We have our, you should have right now your spiritual gift or gift cluster, and you should have your ministry passion. But here's what you need to finish your servant profile, your leadership style. So how can I do it with style? Psalm 139 is the key passage. It is a passage I love. I'm going to quote it. Um, I use this passage when I preach my uncle's funeral. And, it, and I, I never really attended to this passage until I did it for that funeral. And it's one of my favorite songs. Uh, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What a powerful passage, right? Um, so, in this session, you will identify three characteristics of personal style. You'll identify the two key elements of personal style. You'll determine your personal style using the personal style assessment. You'll compile your servant profile, and you'll identify two ministry possibilities that reflect your servant profile. All right, page 130. Personal style is God-given. Now read number two together. There is no right or wrong personal style. There is no right or wrong personal style. Personal style answers the how question. Exactly. And then you have that wonderful song that I, I quoted from. By the way, part of that song the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest sea, even there your hand will find me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say to the darkness, hide me, even the darkness shall be me. As the noonday, midnight is bright as light. It's a beautiful song. I recommend it. All right, now here's what I want you to do. Write your name on A. Write your name down. Just write it down next to letter A in that way. Now, if you are right-handed, just put right hand right that right next to it. Right hand. That's what it looks like when you write it with your right hand. Now switch hands. And write your name again on B. <laughs> and again, if you used your left hand for that, write left hand. <laughs> you can decide to do it with your left if you want. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, my oldest brother, my eldest brother, and I was 
he was naturally a south part. And my dad made him do everything with his right hand. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> All right. Personal style elements. Task-oriented versus people-oriented people. This scale describes how we receive and focus our emotional energy. How are you energized? Are you energized by a task or are you energized by people? Right? People. Task-oriented are energized by doing things. People-oriented are energized by interacting with people. If you are task-oriented, the primary content of your ministry should be a, accomplishing, guess what? Tasks. <laughs> accomplishing tasks that serve people. Your primary focus should be on task accomplishment. All right. If you are high way. I think you guys may know what I'm oriented toward because we didn't have much of a break. All right, if you are people oriented, the primary content of your ministry should be more involved with direct people interaction. Direct people interaction. Your primary focus should be on relational issues. Now here's a note. Both people-oriented and task-oriented value developing relationships and meeting goals, but each has a primary and secondary means of achieving them. All right, that's task versus people-oriented. How about structured versus unstructured? This scale describes how you prefer to organize yourself. Unstructured people prefer to have lots of options and flexibility. Structured people prefer to plan and bring order to their lives. If you are unstructured, your ministry position should be generally described. Generally described. Your relationships with others should be spontaneous. That's if you are unstructured. But now if you are structured, your ministry position should be clearly defined. Your relationships with others should be consistent. Here again, there's a note. Both unstructured and structured have value being organized, but each has a different approach to organization. One looks like an artist and the other looks like an accountant. <laughs> All right, here are the directions. Page 133, personal style assessment. For each item, check the word you think best describes what you would prefer to do or be in most situations. Do not answer according to what you feel is expected by a spouse, family member, employer, etc. Select the behavior or perspective that would come naturally to you if you knew there were no restrictions on or consequences for your personal expression. How are you organizing? And you choose the number that is closest to the answer? That's right. So, for instance, number one, while on vacation, I prefer to. If you prefer to be spontaneous, you would be a, either a one or a two. If it's neither, 
if you, if you prefer to follow a set plan, it may be four or five. If it's indifferent, it'll be a three. You see? And if you prefer, if you are a five on that, and your spouse is a one, they feel like they're working on vacation. Jeff Elmore was my father in ministry, and he he would not only calculate all the hours he spent on his week plan, but then he would calculate the hours he spent or the time he spent calculating the hours for his week plan. <laughs> I tell you, he had me down to the teeth. He shaved me in many ways. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. And I spent this many minutes calculating for the week plan. And Jared has a lot of that. <laughs> Why I need it. Exactly. All right, total your score there on how are you organized? Is now the raw score you want there? The raw score, that's right. And now how are you energized? Do the same for how you are energized on page one hundred and thirty four. Thank you. 
I was there from 2005 to 2007. That name sounds familiar. Miss, yes, I didn't take any classes from her, but I do remember seeing your name on the list of professors. All right, now, if you've tabulated both those scores, on the bottom of page 134, it says tabulate your profile. On the grid, on the next page, put an X on the O scale. The O scale is the vertical, I mean, I'm sorry, the horizontal scale. Put an X on the O scale that corresponds to your O total from page 133. So, from, you see the E scale goes this way, vertical. The O scale goes horizontal, right? Uh, from page 133, Put an X on that O scale. So for instance, I had 24. That was my total. So right on the O scale, I put my 24, put an X right through it, right next to the 21 and the 28. See where yours is. And then draw, and then on the grid, put an X on the E scale that corresponds to your E total from above. So here again, the E scale is the vertical scale, and I got an 18, so I put an X right on the 18. Now draw a vertical line through the X marked on the O scale. And you'll see an example on the top of page 35, that vertical line. Mine went right down through the 24, and then draw a horizontal line through the number circled on the E scale. And I did that again. That's the 18. Your personal style is indicated where the lines meet. So let me, let me come along here. I'm going to give someone with the gift of health. <laughs> there you go. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Let me let me help here. Did you discover? I did. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that's <laughs> 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 
Yes. All right, well, we, we're making some discoveries here. Now let me tell you what's going on. Is this your, is this where you fall? So she structures that. She structures it. Well, so, so some of my, I had a student, this student who took this at La Sierra, she was in the MDiv program. Guess what she fell? Right where the 21, she actually crossed both lines perfectly in a cross. Yeah, I was so angry when that when that when that score came back. <laughs> I said, and, and I said that fits you because everything you do frustrates me, and I don't know why. <laughs> She graduated and she's doing real well. But uh, but she just had, it was always an assignment that was done just bad enough and yet good enough that I had to go ahead and say, all right, good. <laughs> she frustrated me because she did. So look, this week we have different styles. And, and she gave a name for what she was. She said, I'm versatile and flexible. <laughs> so now, if you turn, uh, so transfer your personal style to page 140 in the guide. Mine is task structure. Are we coming back to the other stuff? Yes. Because, you know, I have the task, I gotta get figured out here. <laughs> you need clear instructions. You need clear instructions. So now, now, let me make sure. So you mean on page 136, right? Yes, we are. We are. <laughs> just make, we just want you to put down my personal style and mine is task structure. You all know what yours is. And this is important to know because if you're working on a team here and you understand each other's style of working, you can work together a little better. <laughs> So, so let's come back. Um, circle where you are on page one thirty six. Uh, where what quadrant you fall in? Uh, task unstructured. General guidelines. That's what they need. They're versatile. Helps wherever needed. Likes tangible results. Uh, now I'm on page 136. I'm sorry. I'm just reading these characteristics, uh, the four personal quadrant styles, and so task unstructured. You see it there? General guidelines, versatile, helps wherever needed, likes tangible results. Consider the kind of ministry position that needs you to fulfill a wide variety of responsibilities. <laughs> that that would be that would be helpful, I guess. You know. <laughs> I'm thinking she's thinking we need a do-over. <laughs> <laughs> you should not be in the same room. Illuminating. Illuminating. You know where it says, "Who's going to wash the dishes?" She is. Who's going to wash the car? She is. What are you going to wa wash? I'm going to watch TV. <laughs> Quite illuminating at the, the pre-marriage counseling. <laughs> yeah, so a wide variety of responsibilities. How about task structure? Getting the job done. 
focused on results, prefers to follow an agenda, appreciates clear direction. Consider the kind of ministry position that allows you to know clearly what the goals are and how the task is to be accomplished. Uh, Answer both to fill a what? Uh, wide variety. Well, a wide variety. Wide. Yeah, thank you. How about people unstructured? Spontaneous situations, very controversial, conversational, <laughs> relates well to others, tends to be flexible. Consider the kind of ministry position that gives you the freedom to respond to people spontaneously. <laughs> Discovery. <laughs> and then people structured. Defined relationships, projects warmth, familiar surroundings, enjoys familiar relationships, Consider the kind of ministry position that will enable you to interact with people in more stable or defined settings. And so although my, my student said she was versatile and flexible, I said if you hit on the 21 both, vertical and horizontal, you probably are adaptable and adjusting, <laughs> you know. Well, I'm going to fail you, but that's that. All right, so look here on page 139, this is by the important. Personal style does explain our behavior, but it does not excuse it. <laughs> you knew that was coming up. It does explain, but it does not excuse it. Oh, they all watch the car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are almost finished with lesson seven. All right, session set directions. Share your servant profile with your huddle group. As the other members of your huddle group share their servant profiles, note their names, passions, spiritual gifts, and personal styles in the many servant profile boxes at the bottom of the page. Have the group suggest some ministry possibilities and write these possibilities in the space provided on the next page. Check two of the ministry possibilities that interest you most. Don't feel limited by the ministries your church may or may not have, okay? So find those people in your group, write their names if you have, but you can have no more than uh, two, three in a group, all right? So write the names, write their passion, their ministry passion, write their spiritual gifts, write their personal style, and then share with each other ministry possibilities at your church that might interest you. And remember, it doesn't have to be a ministry currently in place. It might be one that you you look to see started. Folks, we're doing good. Those of you who are people unstructured, this is a tax. <laughs> Any volunteers? Yes, there's a group. Let me see if I can get. Oh, 
Pastor Pastor Honus. Pastor Honus? Yes, sir. Three to a group. <laughs> At most. Unstructured and talking. Yeah. Three, right? Three other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, you might want to join this group right here. There's three. What is this? There you go. Sorry, I'm a little behind here. Get to list on 142 the ministry possibilities at your church, whether or not those ministries exist. Like 
And he likes to look at them. <laughs> and why wouldn't they? <laughs> Who hasn't talked in the group yet? <laughs> All right. All right. I'm, I'm now going to start moving us into our session summary. Okay. Session seven summary. Personal style answers the how question. Personal style elements. They are task oriented people-oriented, it speaks to how we are energized, unstructured structure, how we are organized. And your servant profile is God's design for you. So serving, and this is, this is the point, I, I, I want to slow us down. We generally have an annual nominating committee where people are involved or asked to join ministries. Here, here. Guess what? Service is not for a year. Service is for a lifetime. Serving is for a lifetime. I'm going to read this passage, 1 Peter 4.10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So in this session, session eight, you will list two principles of serving for a lifetime, identify the difference between unique contributions and community contributions, identify two factors that affect your ability to make a unique contribution, and review the second step of the connections process, namely the consultation. So let's just do this real quick. I have five minutes. Worship is expected for a lifetime. Stewardship is required for a lifetime. Serving also is for a lifetime. Your unique contribution. Your unique contribution is serving in a way that expresses your unique servant profile. That's 147. Your unique servant profile. Passion, spiritual gifts, and personal style. Your community contribution, community contributions involve the ongoing responsibilities of the church to provide a place for worship and ministry. So we all make unique contributions and then we all have community contributions. I, I, I grabbed some language from uh, what was this guy's name? He does all these leadership seminars. Maxwell. Yeah, I was at John, John Maxwell. I was at a uh, a leadership conference at Jack Hayford's church on the way a couple of decades, maybe a decade or so ago. And Jack, uh, Jack, uh, I mean, uh, Mac John Maxwell said his father never gave them allowance. He paid them if they read a book and wrote a book report, but he didn't pay them for doing chores at the house. He said, their allowance was, I allow you to live here. <laughs> That's what community contributions are about. Sometimes the church just needs you to make a community contribution. And that's, that's when we kind of pitch in. But then there's that unique contribution and the way you want to embody your ministry in the church and be fulfilled and energized is through your servant profile, which is your unique contribution. All right. How about page 148? This is very, very important. 
factors that affect your ability to, to make a unique or community contribution. There are factors that relate to your availability. Write them down. I, I, I wrote down, I had at the time, preschool children, business travel, right? Um, it may be that being single, or distance, the distance you are from the church. I don't know. What are those availability factors that you have to list? And they affect your ability to make your unique or your community contribution. And then there are spiritual maturity factors. Write those down. Appropriate responsibilities to your spiritual maturity. Maybe your experiences in life. Whatever they are. Your consultant will work with you to identify areas of ministry for your for which your servant profile indicates a possible fit. For your consult your consultation, you'll need to complete pages 161 to 168 in the appendix. That's something you can do on your own. Um, so here's a summary. Why are why we are to serve, we're to serve because we are to glorify God and we're to edify others. How we are to serve, we're to do it using our servant profile. Our passion answers the where question. This is where we will serve in ministry. Our spiritual gifts answers the what question. This is what we will do when we get there. And the personal style answers the how question. When we serve, we are to serve as a body, as a body. We have been invited into the fellowship of the cross. When we baptize people, we are baptizing them into the body of Christ. When we partake of of the table fellowship, it is the body of Christ. And when we hear the preached word, it is calling us together into a body of Christ, a community. And that's how we're to serve as a body, and we're to serve in love. And what's done in love will last forever, and that's why service is for a lifetime. You know what? On page 153 at your own time, just fill out the course evaluation, tear it off. Give it to Pastor Honus, and um, and I'm certain that there'll be a way in which uh, together a team can be pulled together to kind of take you through consultations and ask what's the next step for the Santa Clarita Seventh Day Adventist Church. Uh, how might you take the Connection Seminar and build upon it? Uh, in small teams, it might be starting with the leadership, requiring that leaders of the church go through the seminar. It might be that different ministry leaders will, if it's choir or, or, or the deacon board, that the, the chairs, the directors will decide to offer the seminar for those ministries that they're part of. I don't know, but it's something that you all can, can continue. I thank you for the for the opportunity to share this time. And let me can I pray? Please. Is that all right? Just to because I feel Thanksgiving. Gracious God, I thank you for the ministry of the Santa Clarita Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, a body of believers, a congregation of Christians called together to worship, to word and to table, to baptize and to teach. Bless them in their ministry endeavors, in their ministry and witnessing zone that you have given them. Grow them in grace, in knowledge, in wisdom, in understanding. And may they celebrate the gifts that you have given those who have come into the fellowship of the cross. Paradoxically, in your death, you have offered gifts of life 
that keep giving for a lifetime. May they celebrate it, and may we all as a community of faith celebrate together in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I found that helpful. I hope you found that helpful. And uh, please do fill out your evaluation. Um, I don't know if we'll ever be fully done with nominating committee here, but I do think that uh, it would be great if we had uh, a data bank that included the kind of final surveys that we get to. You'll note a few pages later, beyond the evaluation, there's uh, a form, and a rather extensive form that gets filled out mm -hmm. with your quote evaluation team or your administrator, however you want to work that out. I'm happy to sit down with any of you. I'm sure Milton would be. Uh, and just go through that, turn that in. We would like to compile these. We would like to have these surveys back and start to collect data. Not because we're data kings and want to own data on you, but because it's really nice to be able to say to a nominating committee, no, this person isn't at all gifted for that, or this person's very interested and capable in this area. And that will help streamline the process and help us plug people into where they belong. So I think this has tremendous value. Thank you for showing us the way. Um, I have no offense to the authors of this book. There are moments in this book that are mind-numbingly boring from my point of view. And Dr. Jackson manages to get through without even a hint of suggestion that it would be that. <laughs> so, I don't know how you do that, but that is the gift of teaching, ladies and gentlemen, the gift of teaching. Because I went through them and I said, Let's, these are the areas you move fast through. Oh, okay. all right. Well, good, good. Um, so you nailed that. Uh, <laughs> I would like uh, us to talk about, as a group, um, forming teams of people who can go on to teach this. This will end up being small group style teaching. It will not be classes of this size going forward, probably. We may have one or two every few years that it could be this size. But it'll be you sitting down with a ministry of people, a team, or a small group of people, and working through the workbook over the course of four or six hours, as much as we have, maybe on a Sabbath afternoon, maybe on a Tuesday night, I don't care. But now that you have the training and seen how, the, how this work and it works and have been through it, we can certainly multiply this ministry, and I'd like to see us, us try to do that. 